Okay, so welcome. This is a talk about uh, weird, strange, funny stuff I found uh, in Erlang um, in my 10 years of experience working on it. I've been collecting tiny bits and receiving contributions from many people. I'm Brujo, I'm from Argentina. That's why I sound not so English. I will try my best. Um, and this talk was originally based on this one. <laughs> Have you seen that one? The what? Yeah, excellent. If you don't, check it out. It's five minutes. Super worthy. It's not on YouTube. You have to check it in, in, the, in uh, Gary's website. But Gary is a, is a programmer, but it's also, he's also a stand-up comedian. So he's much more funny than me. I will, I will do my best. I am not a comedian. I am a father and a nerd. So these kind of things will happen along the presentation. And sorry, you have to bear with me. Yeah, that one was that one goes well. Okay, let's let me show you a couple of things. To put them all in context, I will I will work along this couple of minutes on a simple exercise that I'm pretty sure everybody's familiar with. It's a fist bus. You have seen it in uh, interviews and stuff. It's a very simple thing to do. I will add a little bit of complication to it just to show you stuff. And uh, the the best warning I can give you is don't copy and paste. Nothing that I, uh, that I will show here should be on production code ever, okay? Okay, so this is the exercise. We will write a script, a script that receives a parameter, which is a number, and it actually counts until that number. For every, it, when, it's, when I say counts, it prints the numbers. Prints the numbers until that, that one, starting from one. If the number is divisible by three, it prints fees. If it's divisible by five, it prints bus. And if it's divisible by both, it prints fist bus. The only tricky part that is not usual, uh, usually found in interview questions is the last one. It should, it should work for floating point numbers. The, the, the trick here is that since it will count up to, if you put a floating point number, once we are past that point, we don't print any more numbers. Simple enough, right? OK, let's see how how screw up we can uh, create a script for that. Uh, first of all, let's define a module. And if you don't see it correctly there, I can make it bigger for you. Look at this. Is it, is it wrong? What do you think? Did I just, just botch my first line? Not really. It actually works. You don't need parentheses in, uh, in Erlang attributes. I can show you. You compile and it's a module. So since the introduction of type and spec, there are attributes without parentheses, every single attribute, you can write that down without parentheses. Module, export, it's, uh, it's cool, it's fine. It's something I found later in my, in my Erlang history, but it actually works. I will come back to that in a bit. But for now, let's, let's start with a very simple case. Let's just print out numbers. Okay, easy, very easy. We write down two functions. The first one is the one that's exported. You provide the number, it calls the other one, and it does, the other one is uh, the recursive function that traverses the list of numbers and prints them out. So uh, remember, we cannot do strict pattern matching here because we are working with floating point numbers, all right? So we have to traverse until we exceeded the maximum value, the, the input provided by the user. Anybody see that, right? Okay. In, uh, in the last one, when uh, top is uh, below the number that we are going to print, we don't print the number, we print a new line, and that's all. Let's see if it works. We try to compile. Fair enough. So we count up to 10. This is super test-driven development. And then, and then you got it. One to 10, excellent. Now, before moving on, we need to validate, we need to start adding special cases here. So the first one I want to add is to check for uh, input that's wrong, that's not a number, okay? If it's not a number, I have to print a, a message. I will do it in a super, super wrong way, not the way you have to do it, but just, so, just to show you what happens. So uh, I have two functions. Of course, instead of choosing the one with one uh, clause, I will choose the one with two clauses. And I will do this. I will add a guard 
to check that the provided input is actually a number. It looks like this. So if it's a number, then everything as before, so both clauses. But if it's not the number, it will fall in the last one, right? Simple, clear, nothing to worry about. Let's go to the console and compile the module. Perfect. Now we try with something that should break the code. Not the number, should print the message that it's not the number. What do you think? It's no nope, it's correct, not the number. <laughs> the problem here is this one. That one, we already proven it works. But test driven development, we have to do regression tests here. So we try again. Aha. Uh Aha. -huh. Uh -huh. OK. What just happened? The problem is that one I will show you. The problem is that and and or, for what it's worth, they have a, some precedence logic that it's quite complicated. And so the, the, the guard was understood as if it's a number top, uh, if, it's a num if it's number top and top, if all that is bigger than one, then do the thing. <laughs> yeah. And, and this, this popped up in the Erlang questions mailing list. And if you, if you know Costis, Costis is a guy that when, when he answers emails, he writes a long paragraph. He explains everything in detail for you. In this case, he said, don't use and. Use and also. <laughs> Done. Don't question. So with and also, everything works. OK. OK. Uh, I moved it up. I, I, I turned that thing into the proper thing so that I don't have to deal with those wiki weird clauses down there. So I, I'm validating the input on the proper function. This is the only thing I'm doing right in this whole presentation. I promise, no more, no more good things. So let's compile with not a number, of course. And if we count, it's fine. Everything, everybody happy. OK, let's add fees and bus here. Remember, I'm on an interview. So I have to look super smart. I won't implement the, the, the useful function because the interviewer will say, well, that's just another programmer. I'm not just another programmer. So I will do a super smart way to print this bus and all that stuff. And basically, it goes like this. So if the number is divisible by 3, I print this. If it's divisible by 5, I print bus. If it's divisible by both of them, I already printed this bus. See? Smart. <laughs> but of course, yeah, if it's not divisible by any of those, I will print the number. Fair enough? It's a little bit imperative. Oh, oh of course, I'm printing the space at the end. Otherwise, the numbers will be all chunked up, right? Um, uh, it's a little bit imperative, well, not, but it's a smart way. It should impress the interviewer. Let's see if it works. We compile, of course. And we try to count up to 10, and yeah, no. That didn't work. Why? Who knows? I missed the else part of the if. The ifs in Erlang are expressions. As, as everything else, they always need a value. If you don't provide a way to understand what happens when the, the guard is not true, it crashes. You're missing a clause there, in this case. True, because it's the else, it's the way of writing else in uh, Erlang. So this is what I have to add, right? If it's divisible by three, fees. If not, I don't care. If it's divisible by five, same thing. And the other one, same thing. And I'm super bored, and I have to use two columns in the, in the slide. I really don't want that. But let's first think, uh, check if it works. And of course, Pretty nice, it works, it's perfect. Yeah, of course, I was testing up to 10, right? There is no fist bus there. What do you think, will that work? Yeah, you were expecting to fail, I see you. <laughs> Not this time. But then again, two columns. I don't want that column on the right. So, and I'm not the only one. I found many people in the Erlang community that really deeply wanted an else-less if. They, they super heavily wanted that. And they came, came up with not one, not two, but three different ways 
to implement else-less if. None of them is good, but there are three. And so I have three clauses there, pure, pure um, lack, right? No, not intentional. I have three, uh, ways, three places there. I will show you three ways of getting else-less ifs in Erlang. Let's start with the ugliest one. Okay, remember and also, and also is a short circuit operator. So if what's on the left of uh, the and also clause, okay, I turn this into this. So if whatever is on the left side of and also is false, everything is false and the right side is not evaluated. And if that's true, then it needs to keep evaluating. But it doesn't validate that, what you, that the result in the end is, uh, is a Boolean. Because there are no Booleans in Erlang, right? It's atoms. So whatever you put there, it works. So that is a, is provides the same behavior as if you were having an, if less, an else-less if. If it's true, evaluates that thing. If it's false, yeah, does, does not evaluate that thing. Dialyzer will, will not be happy with you. But the code is there. So let's see if that works. We start trying just with 25. We forget the 10. And there you go, fist bus, everything funny. Now let's, let's check another one. And this one, this one is really weird. There is a way to write, there are many ways to write lists in Erlang, right? My favorite one is list comprehensions. And somebody, at some time, came up with these incomprehensions. <laughs> Let me show you that like that. OK, what's going on there? List comprehension. This is one of those things in Erlang that you always read in a sort of convoluted direction. But basically, to the right of the two pipes, you have to tell Erlang where to build a list from. And on the left side, you tell, you tell Erlang what to do with each one of the elements in the list, all right? It's, you're supposed to provide an origin there. A, what's the name of it? A generator on the right side. And filters, or many generators, and many filters. But you can provide no generators. So you say, just give me something if, it's, uh, if uh, i is divisible by 5. Something. Where do you take him from? I don't know. Mystical beings. And on the other side, for each one of those things, compute this thing, this, this expression. As you can see, there is no reference to anything on the left side here, right? Because if I put a variable there, I'm screwed. That's, a, that's kind of the, the point of this. So what we are doing here is writing a, a list comprehension with just one filter or many filters and a unique expression with, not, with no variable tie it to any filter on the left side. This has the effect of producing a list with one item, that's the result of evaluating the expression, if the filters are true, and a, an empty list uh, if the filters are false. An empty list where you, you didn't even compute the expression, of course. So in a weird way, it's an else-less if again. It actually works. There you go. And if you think that, oh, if you think that's, that's weird, you know nothing yet. Look at this. OK, example, I show you that. I showed you that before, right? If, you, if it, the filter is false, it produces a list with one element evaluating the expression. Uh, it produces an empty list, sorry. All right? If it's true, a list with one element. And now? What do you expect here to happen? I would take an exception every day because it, that's not even a filter, not a generator, it's nothing, right? Yeah, no, it's not an exception. It's an empty list. Okay, but let me show you a function that is amazing. That's an identity function. That's the first function that teach you when, you when they teach in you Haskell, for instance. So it basically takes an element and it, it returns the same one, unaltered, okay? OK, now we have the function. And so identity of false is false. 
And so the, empty, the result is an empty list, as above. Identity of true is true. So the result is a list with x, as line 23. And so identity of something is something, and the result is, of course, an exception. <laughs> yeah, and I, I leave you to, uh, as a homework, to try with different kinds of functions. You can try with nifs, with bifs, with other things, and each one of those, you have to try it. You, you never guess what's going on there. OK. OK, now the last one. The last one is the, is the obvious one. I, I leave it for the, for the final part because it suits the code. But remember, when, when you have an if without an else clause, that generates an error, right? If you, if you, when it's evaluated, there is no true clause, it produces an error. OK, there is a way to catch the error. So you, yeah, turn this into this. <laughs> right. Yeah, 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 I know, I know. If, if IO format fails for some reason, you're catching the error as well. Doesn't matter, man. You have an else's if, that's all you care. That's all I care about. Less lines of code. That's all. And so, okay. So you compile, it works, and we got rid of the second column. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, but yeah, here's this friend of mine constantly bugging me because he, he saw uh, an internet uh, course about Erlang and it was Erlang OTP and I'm not writing any OTP here. Okay, John, let's do it. Let's go with OTP. Okay, column on the right is what we had before. Yeah, the same function as I had before. Do you trust me? I don't want to. I don't want to touch a, a single character of that code any anymore in my entire life. I'm okay with that. Oh, so peaceful. I feel so good. Okay, now Gen Server. Well, I went to the internet and I copy pasted the Gen Server here. It was super straightforward, and I also did a little bit more. I checked the documentation, and uh, I checked that start link actually returns okay. PID if it, the server started, and error or error, whatever you provide, if you return from init with stop and a value, right? So, super dumb. I, I don't want to write any function, so I, I wrote a gen server that basically computes, uh, prints the numbers and stays there. Yeah, leaking memory, all that stuff. I don't care, I just want to write less code. So, init function, if it's a number, calls the other function. Same thing as before, but if it's not the number, returns stop, not the number. That ends up in error, not the number, and prints the error. All right? Looks good, right? Seems to be correct. It's according to documentation, and the code is copy-pasted from the internet, so it's fine. <laughs> so I, I compile the module, I compile the module, and suddenly, what just happened? Where is my macro? Are you telling me the internet is wrong? <laughs> okay, who knows? What am I missing here? Why, why module is not defined? Because not exactly, no. No, you don't need a behavior. You do need parentheses. <laughs> oh yeah! Least fans out there are joying. Yeah. You can take out the parentheses and the macros, which is good, but not, uh, but not use one or the other, right? So with parentheses, it works. And when we try this, it works. And now let's try the other case where we have something that's not a number. And of course, it prints a beautiful message. That's not what I wrote before. Mm hmm. What just happened? Is this is the computer is super smart and understanding what I want to print? It's printing something else, right? No. There is something odd here, right? I it, that said an exception, and I have a case. Case is not with exceptions. So let's use an, uh, let's use something that actually deals with exceptions. Try catch. Fair enough. Any exception, any type, anything. So I catch whatever and print the message. Okay, let's go to the console. 
generate the exemption, <clears throat> catch the exception, <clears throat> try catch the exception, <clears throat> uh -huh. what am I missing? What am I missing? Ah, that's the thing. Exit signals are faster than return values. So if you are, if you are doing a, ca a case with a return value of a process that you are, that's linked to you, you are dead. The console s looks like it's a constant flow, but every single line of those is a different shell process. So we are trapping exits now, and there you go, not the number. You see? OK, we can, also, we can also do a different thing. Instead of start link, which is the problem, we replace that with start, like this, all right? And so if you start the thing instead of linking it, when it dies, you won't be affected. That's the thing. Let's try that. Of course, we have to go back to the previous state. Otherwise, you won't believe what I'm doing. And, and then we try with the exception, not an exception, everybody is happy. I, this thing actually hit me three times in 10 years. Two of those times, I wrote a blog post about it. <laughs> but the second one, I already forgot in the first one. And somebody reminded me that, hey, is this thing again? I, I really hope by giving this talk, I don't forget anymore. <laughs> OK, now. Uh, that's not how gen servers are, right? Everybody knows that for gen server, you have to you have to have a, a handle call, a handle info, all that stuff. Not in it, not leaking memory, all that stuff. So let's do it in the proper way. Uh, and basically, what I'm doing now is I split up this com this behavior. So I start the server on one function, and I count on another one using a gen server call. Okay. But let let's look at that particular atom there. You see, in it, nothing. Before, we had a number there, because uh, we had the code for, computing the for uh, printing the numbers on the init function. Let me digress a little bit about this. It, this is not a, what, what, I'm, what I'm about to show you is not particularly bad or tricky or funny about Erlang. It's more about our, ourselves, like people reading Erlang documentation. I am, a, I am also an Erlang trainer. So every once in a while, I go to some office to talk, about a, to talk to a group of people and tell them how to write gen servers or, or what gen servers are in general, et cetera, et cetera. One of the things that happened every single time I gave a class about this is that they are faced with this documentation. This is straight from the OTP docs, all right? And so you see there is no documentation here. This is just an example, right? And then you have this gen server start link. The first part is easy. Local name. That's the name of the process. No problems with that. The second one is the module that implements the callbacks. In particular, this very same module. The last one I don't care. Nobody cares. It's an empty list. Sometimes you put the bug in it, but forget about it for now. But the third one is a list an empty list there, and it's in the way that you express it is a list of arguments, right? Those arguments are going to the init function. OK, and the init function has one argument called args. I will go back to that. So whatever you put there comes here, all right? That's very easy to see. But this happens all the time. You want to send an one argument to the init function, but that over there is the list of arguments. So you put the argument in the list, and of course, it doesn't work, right? Because it's trying to add a list with, a, with an element to two that crashes. So args is not actually a list of arguments. Args is an argument. It's one thing, an argument. So if you, do, if you send a list, you get a list. That's ugly. Don't do that. Don't do that. Let's say you wanna, the, the purpose of it is to, if you want to send multiple arguments, right? So you send a list of arguments, and you get the list of arguments on the other side. All right? 
uh, yeah, but actually lists are in, in general, in general or semantically, um, not bounded in size. So, so you have, when you, when you will receive a list, you are, let's say you are specking the function with dialyzer. If you, sp you specify the list that you're going to receive, you never, you're not allowed to say how many elements that list has, right? It can be one, two, three, whatever. So if you're doing this, you are, yeah, misusing list. If only we have an element and, and, and type of data that allows you, us to establish things that have a fixed number of arguments. What should we use there, right? Lists or not? Tuples. That will be much more convenient. So if you have two arguments, you want to put them in an object, you put a tuple with it. But, the, but s since uh, not, not so long ago, we have an even cooler way of doing that. You can put names to your arguments using maps. And you see? Look at that, how cool it is. Of course, if you want to send nothing because you don't need an argument, yeah, you send nothing like that. And it's super clear. That, that lesson, it's always one of the first I gave to, to people on the, on the training course and always <laughs> comes up with somebody trying to send a list of their, so eventually, I think I will, I will send a pull request to the documentation, to the OTP documentation to put a tuple or a map there to, better, to, to give a better example. Going back to, going back to our fist bus thingy, this is handle call. This is what happens when you want to print uh, the numbers with the fist bus. I, am, I basically copy it from the other side, and if it's not a number, I'm throwing a, an exception there. Look how, how smart I am. I learned from before. I'm not writing if here. I'm using and also. Super good. And then I get the response. Everything fine, right? So it's a server. When I go to the console and I compile, I have to start it first. Uh, and I put the name on it so I can call it. And then I count up to 25. And it actually works. And the only thing that's missing here is to try to see what happens if I provide something that's not a number. And uh, yeah, that happens because I didn't add the behavior option there. So when it compiles, it, that it didn't tell me what method I'm missing. So I need uh, terminate. Let's add terminate here. OK, terminate. And let's try again. OK, server terminating with the reason, but return value, error, not number. That was not what I was expecting to happen. I wanted to report the error, but the server, I, I, wanted, the, I wanted that server to keep running. And this error actually gives me a clue of what I have to do. It says, but return value. That means what I'm throwing there is, is understood as a return. It's if I would return like in the last statement there. So I create a return value there, and let's see what, how it goes. I start the server, try with not a number, that's a message, and if I try with something, the server is still up, there you go, you see that? You can, you can return from the middle of your handle call, handle cast uh, uh, functions as long as you provide a valid return value. That's super cool. And, and you know, that took me, this was the hardest lesson I ever learned in, Ar in Erlang yet. It took, me, it took me many conversations, some, some of them with Robert, and I misguided a couple of uh, students over the course of the years, sorry. But, uh, but I, I will get it straight this time. This is the thing. I come from an object-oriented uh, paradigm. I used to be a small talk process, um, programmer. So uh, I found out that I, the way I would use exceptions in an uh, object-oriented uh, paradigm is not the same way to use this, those things in, in here. I kind of expected that. But I didn't expect it to be so, so radically different. Let's see. So in Erlang, this is a basic one. And this is an easy one. What, what in Erlang is an error, in OOP is an error. That's fine. Runtime errors are handled that way. You can try catch. Nothing to say about it. Now, now the weird part. So in object-oriented languages, you have a method. And uh, there is some problem with the parameters. 
but it's an expected problem. It's something that can happen. So let's say you're you, you are you're writing a method to look up a user in the database, and they provided an ID for something that's not a user. So you have to say that there is no user, right? You can return null, or if you are a proper object-oriented person and you hate null, as you should, you return, uh, you, you throw an exception informing that uh, the user was not found, so the caller can deal with the exception, et cetera. That's because not, not every function returns a value in, uh, in OOP, and those, the, the, the ones that do return a value, they are expected to return it in a proper class or type or object, et cetera. But in Erlang, we have a pattern matching and tuples, and we can return complex objects, so we basically use target tuples instead of throw. If you're, if you're implementing the, that lookup function for a user, you may return OK and the user, or error and what happened, you know, not found or whatnot. That's fine. That's tricky, but fine. Not, no big deal. But then you have unexpected bad, resu uh, bad results. When somebody, something should be interpreted as an, as an error, but it's, a not, it's not a runtime error. It's something that went wrong there. You, you tried to write a file, and the file was not there, or you ran out, out of space in the, in the hard, uh, hard drive or whatever, and so you want to throw an exception. This is the thing. In Erlang, you don't throw an exception. You exit the function with exit. Exit one, not to be confused with exit two that deals with uh, exit signals, unless it's brutal kill that kills the process. But n n never mind. So exit one is what you will s we use for throwing exceptions with really bad results. Again, it can be caught in a try catch, but it's not, a, uh, it's not um, an expected error. It's something bad. But then you have throw. And, and what is throw then? And for, for 10 years, I listen to people say that throw is non-local return. I think Robert Birding told me that at least 10 times. Throw is for non-local return. And I was, I was, how fancy name for throwing exceptions. What, what a good name, right? Non-local return, which well, it's not. It's not like that. This is the deal. This is the deal. Let's say you have a function that doubles every element in a list. Yeah, there's two versions of the same thing. On the left side, we are doing local return. This is an anonymous function in between that returns not a number to whoever is calling it. In this particular case is the implementation of list map. So within list map, uh, the code is calling the anonymous function for each one of the elements. And this function returns not a number there, in that part of the code. On the other hand, on the right side, we are doing kind of the same thing, but instead of returning not a number, we are throwing it. And that doesn't mean that we are producing an exception or whatnot. What we are doing here is returning not a number, not to map, to list map. We are returning not a number to the outermost color, the one with try and catch. It looks like an exception. It looks like, in any other language, that's how you handle exceptions, but not in Erlang. Here you are returning stuff. And I said before, I was a small dog programmer. And in a small dog, we have the same thing. You can use the, the hat, the little hat in the, with two arrows like this, and you jump from a closure to the outermost part. I didn't recognize that thing here, but this is that thing. That's why if you're writing your open source libraries or libraries that we, other people will use, use exit, don't use throw. Throw is to, to be used within a try. You need to know that you are there. When you're throwing an exception, that's exit. Wow. OK. OK, final part. Let's back to our, our current business with FISBA. We wanted a, an S script, not, a, not an Erlang program. So we write an, X, an S script here, basically, I put a little usage message if the parameter is not provided. If a parameter is provided, I just call the function that we had before. There you go. I compile. Nope. This is an S script. Don't compile. This is interpreted. So I just use it. This is a usage message. 
I try with 25. Ah, yeah, claro. Uh, 25 is not a number, of course. Every parameter is a, is a string here. So we have to parse it. All right, let's parse it. We add list to integer there, and we parse the parameter. Fair enough. Go to the console again. Try with 25. It works. But now if we try with uh, something that's not a number, it generates an awful exception. Because list to integer uh, produces a runtime error when, it, uh, when it's not a with the string cannot be parsed as an integer. And we don't want that. Luckily, we have a function that returns, that expects things to may, that may not be integer and returns the integer or a, a tuple informing the error. That function is string to integer. So string to integer, if, it's a, if the input is a proper integer, we return the integer. Uh, if not, it will return an error. I'm leaving the input there so that the internal function prints the message, not the number. You see that? Fine? All right. So 25, not the number. What am I missing here? What? Nope. Floating point numbers. So if I try with a floating point number, eh, there you go. It's not an integer, of course. So. We have to parse floating point numbers, not integers. Damn brujo. We have to parse floating point numbers then. OK. Let's parse the floating point number and not the number and an integer. <laughs> OK. Cascading code for you. So if it's not a float, it might be an integer. And if it's not an integer, all right, going to the right. And then integer works. Floating point number, it works. Not the number, works. But then again, you know, if by this time, you know that I, I like things with less code, smaller things. And so I turn that into this. And I leave you to check why that works. But trust me, it does. <laughs> That's all I have. <laughs> what was your last fight? What was what? Really uh, intentionally. <laughs> <laughs> you mean this one? Yeah. All right. I leave you there. No questions? All right. Cool. Thank you, guys. <laughs>